Hey everyone, welcome back, and we're going to talk about why language matters. In the beginning, at the birth of computing, there were no programming languages. Programming looked like something like this. So there you go. That is a program uh, to add the numbers from 1 to 10 together and print out the result. 1 plus 2 plus 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 10 is equal to 55. Uh, it could run on a simple hypothetical machine. To program early computers, it was necessary to set large arrays of switches in the right position or punch holes in strips of cardboard and feed them to a computer. You can probably imagine how tedious and error-prone this procedure was. Even writing simple programs required much cleverness and discipline. Complex ones were nearly inconceivable. Of course, manually entering these arcane patterns of bits, the ones and zeros, did give the programmer a profound sense of being a mighty wizard. Okay, and that has to be worth something in terms of job satisfaction. Each line of the previous program contains a single instruction. It could be written in English like this. Store the number 0 in memory location 0. And that was 1. 2. Store the number 1 in memory location 1. 3. Store the value of memory location 1 in memory location 2. 4. Subtract the number 11 from the value in memory location 2. If the value in memory location 2 is the number 0, continue with instruction 9. 6. Add the value of memory location 1 to memory location 0. 7. Add the number 1 to the value of memory location 1. 8. Continue with instruction 3. 9. Output the value of memory location 0. Although that is already more readable than the soup of bits, it is still rather obscure. Using names instead of numbers for the instructions and memory locations helps. Set total to zero. Set count to one. And then we have a loop starting. Set compare to count. Subtract 11 from compare. If compare is zero, continue at end. Add count to total. Add one to count. Continue at loop. And as you can see, we jump from loop back up here to loop, which should remind you of the looping operation described in the programming, every programming language uh, ever extended and the you know, very introductory data modeling we've done so far. So can you see how this program works at this point? The first two lines give two memory locations their starting values. Total will be used to build up the result of the computa computation, and count will keep track of the number that we are currently looking at. The lines using compare are probably the weirdest ones. The program wants to see whether count is equal to 11 to decide whether it can stop running. Because our hypothetical machine is rather primitive, it can only test whether a number is 0 and make a decision based on that. So it uses the memory location labeled compare to compute the value of count minus 11 and makes a decision based on that value. The next two lines add the value of count to the result and increment count by 1 every time the program decided that count is not 11 yet. Here is the same program written in JavaScript. Let total equal 0, count equals 1. While count is less than or equal to 10, uh, total plus equals count, count plus equals 1, console.log total. So let's go ahead and grab this. We're going to copy it using command C. We're going to come over and we're going to put this in the section that is actually code. We are going to move this over a little bit so we can see our console a little better. And one thing that is here which you might not have seen before is the let. We've been using var. They essentially mean the same thing. It means create a variable at this point. Uh, the difference has to do with something we'll get into later, but for now we can leave it at this. I'm going to indent these two. And the idea for this is because I want to know what code inside of here is inside of my loop. Now, we are not trying to understand everything going on here, but we are going to run this and see that the output is 55 as it suggests it should be. So, that's going to be it for now. This version gives us a few more improvements. Most important, there is no need to specify the way we want the program to jump back and forth anymore. The while construct takes care of that. It continues executing the block wrapped in braces below it as long as the condition it was given holds. That condition is count is less than or equal to 10, which means count is less than or equal to 10. We no longer have to create a temporary value and compare that to zero, which was just an uninteresting detail. Part of the power of programming languages is that they can take care of uninteresting details for us. 
At the end of the program, after the while construct has finished, the console.log operation is used to write out the result. Finally, here is what the program could look like if we have the convenient operations range and sum available, which respectively create a collection of numbers within a range and compute the sum of a collection of numbers. Console.log sum range 1 to 10. Now, I'm not exactly sure, but this might work in our Revlet. So let's go ahead and we'll get rid of this code here. We'll paste in the updated version, which seems to take a range from 1 to 10, and then pass that to our sum operation or function or something, and then pass whatever the result of that is to console.log, logging whatever we get as a result of these operations to the console. Now, it suggests that we should get 55. Perhaps we will, perhaps we won't. It says sum is not defined and range is not defined. Now, the reason that sum and range are not defined is likely because... Um, well, why would that exactly be? It is likely because the, well, let's speculate. We can speculate that sum and range are not available because they are not part of the JavaScript engine that has been loaded up here. So, for now, we are going to assume that this does not work because of something going on in our processing environment. And for now, we will leave it as is. We can assume that range does that, what it says, and we can assume that sum somehow sums up whatever range gives us. So for now, let's go ahead and not worry about that. And we'll come back to the code or the uh, Telequin JavaScript. So the moral of this story is that the same program can be expressed in both long and short, unreadable and readable ways. The first version of the program was extremely obscure, whereas this last one is almost English. Log the sum of the range of the numbers from one to 10. We will see in later chapters how to define operations like sum and range. Excellent. So that's that's a perfect explanation of why we weren't able to see anything because they're actually not defined. They're not part of what we would call vanilla JavaScript. Now, vanilla JavaScript sounds like something we ought to write down, even though it wasn't actually part of this. Vanilla JavaScript uh, is essentially what comes with JS out of the box. And what we mean by out of the box is that we don't have to load any extra modules, any other extensions. It's essentially what, it, what you get access to without telling JavaScript you want any extra libraries or external resources. I don't really like the idea of calling it vanilla JavaScript. It makes it seem as though JavaScript is, you know, boring. But we're going to call it that because it's a naming convention, so you can stick with it. Okay, a good programming language helps the programmer by allowing them to talk about the actions that the computer has to perform on a higher level. It helps omit details, provides convenient building blocks, such as while and console.log, allows you to define your own building blocks, such as sum and range, and makes those blocks easy to compose. So that's it for this section. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you in the next one.